Welcome to ILTV's Weekly Insider. I'm Steve Leibowitz. A cruel and clearly Hamas-orchestrated form of reality TV has been playing out on Israeli television. Most of the nation is glued to their screens every evening this week to see which of the some 240 hostages snatched from their homes and taken to Gaza on October 7th has been returned. Families are made to agonize through built-up hopes and last-minute delays to see their loved ones come home after more than 50 days in captivity. Hamas is playing on the emotions of the nation as we watch small children, mothers, elderly women reach safety. The drama of the handover from Hamas grotesquely trying to look helpful while bringing their captives to the Red Cross. The handover to Egypt to Israeli officials and then to Israeli hospitals and meetings with anxious family members. And we know that it's all part of a Hamas scheme to delay the IDF advance into Gaza and thwart Israel's goals of winning the war and bringing home all of the hostages. Well, joining us via Zoom to discuss our political analyst and author, Amot Asael, and political science professor and head of NGO Monitor, Dr. Gerald Steinberg. Gerald, let me start with you. We are now in a period of extended pause in fighting to allow for the fruition of the Qatari brokered hostage deals. If we're talking about the overriding goal of ending the Hamas threat from Gaza, is the pause bringing us closer or further away? Steve, it's now something like uh, 52 days since October 7th. And I think that certainly for me and for others, when we do watch the, the hostage releases and the whole the drama that, that's orchestrated, as you said, by Hamas, we all are very aware of all those people who are not coming back. 1,200 Israelis were slaughtered, brutalized. And this is all part of that process. And what Hamas did in the, taking the hostages was a form of insurance trying to prevent the crushing of their military capability to demilitarize Gaza and maybe remove the Hamas regime if possible. So we're in a pause now, as you said, as the Israeli government has repeatedly told us. They use the term deliberately humanitarian pause. Uh, 200 or more trucks are going into Gaza every day. How much, how much of that goes to uh, Hamas people, we don't know. <clears throat> it's going to be very hard to restart the war in a number of ways. It's going to be hard because there's going to be international pressure, not just American, but international or even more so international pressure. But what are the choices? What are the options that Israel has? Because you can't stop in the middle here. Hamas is sort of half demilitarized. The northern part of Hamas, maybe not even that, of Gaza seems to be uh, largely the, the Hamas capabilities, the, the tunnels, all the terror capabilities, the rockets have largely been destroyed. South is largely untouched, but there's now twice as many people in the South. There are lots of dilemmas, and I think that we just need to be aware of how uncertain everything is. It's going to be hard, but I think that the Israeli government and supported by the Israeli public is very determined. It's going to be very hard not to continue with the destruction of, 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 of Hamas after everything that happened and everything that's been said. So it's certainly a dilemma. Amots, we are completing game uh, day 53 of the war. The pause in fighting might be extended for more days. Is there cause to believe that pressures will come to bear before the drive to the south is completed and Hamas is defeated? I mean, I remember hearing no humanitarian aid, not one drop of water, no food, no fuel, and yet they're getting all of that. Well, <clears throat> let's set the rhetoric aside. Um, politicians say many things in many situations, and we don't expect from them consistency or necessarily delivery. What matters is not the rhetoric, but the strategic imperatives. And the strategic imperative that has emerged from what happened on October 7th is for Israel to no longer tolerate on, the pres on, on any of its borders the presence of any jihadist militia. This is the new Israeli strategy. It is shared by all Israelis. In my view, even if Yossi Balin were now prime minister, this would be the strategy. And he's not the prime minister. <clears throat> we have a center-right government now, and this clearly is what drives it. And it is my view, in my view also, what clearly will happen. Now, you rightly cite um, uh, the constraints of uh, the hostage ordeal on the one hand, 
<clears throat> and uh, international pressure that we will surely face um, down the road, I still say that this is the imperative, and I believe that it is shared also by the United States, certainly by the current administration, but also should it be succeeded by heaven knows who and when, I think they too will share this because this is the eradication of Hamas is an American interest, no less than an Israeli interest. They will share it. What they might want and uh, even demand in their polite ways is that it be done in a certain manner. But they will not dispute the need in eradicating Hamas and in seeing to it that it never ever returns to any position of power, let alone any possession of arms. This is going to be um, the goal and it will be achieved. Gerald, all in Israel want all of the hostages home and the sooner the better. Does it seem that more military pressure on Sinwar and Hamas leadership will bring more deals or is the negotiation route over once Israel's renewed the war? I mean, I heard Gallant say that if there are more talks about, renew about releasing hostages, it'll be under fire. Again, what Amot said, and I think it needs to be uh, emphasized, is politicians, not just politicians, but leaders in a position of, of responsibility, say things, but they're not necessarily capable of delivering. They may believe them. They may be saying them for public morale purposes. So yes, we've heard that from Gallant. We've heard it from, from, from Netanyahu. But the question is, what's going to be the situation politically, militarily, at any given time? Is there a plan? How does Israel move? And I don't know how you go forward with this. Again, a, a tremendous, a large portion of the entire Gaza population is now in the southern half. And how do you then operate in that military, militarily? They cleared off as much as they could the northern part of Gaza in order to destroy, to capture, to destroy, to confront all the Hamas capabilities. And infrastructure. And we saw step by step the surrounding of the hospitals, including the final one, the uncovering of the tunnels, the entry into the tunnels, the blowing up of the tunnels. All of that was with a northern part of Gaza, which of which a large part of the population has left and gone south. What do we do now? Does the IDF now tell all the people in the south to go north? What do they do with them? All those things that I'm not going to go into a long set of analyses because the questions are much more focus than any possible answers. It's going to be difficult. I think Amos is absolutely right. Amos is absolutely right that there is an imperative, a strategic imperative to go further. And uh, I think Sinwar and the Hamas leadership, they're playing a very, very calculated strategic game. They're going to hold on to as many of the hostages as they can. Each day gives them greater hope of, prevent, of preventing a major strike in the south, uh, takeover in the south by Sahal, by the IDF, and also may, raises the value of the hostages. If you attack us, we're going to, the hostages will be killed, you will be killed, whatever they say, we won't give back any hostages. That's the, that is their primary card, which they're playing, and playing it very dramatically. But I want to add one other point to all of this, this thing called international public opinion on all of the major media frameworks, platforms. If the BBC or the New York Times or Sky News or Washington Post, it's all, yeah, the hostages are treated as a human interest story, the terrible things they've gone through, and a lot of them say, well, but they were treated well, look how nicely the, the Hamas terrorist is hugging that little boy, all of that. PR, not just PR, but it's terrible propaganda, it's manipulation after the, the absolutely indescribable brutality of Hamas on October 7th, taking these people in the first place. But the media, the international media, a lot of the politicians, we've seen them, the, the prime minister of Spain, the prime minister of, of uh, Belgium and others, have been taking advantage of these images and saying, well, now we have to find a ceasefire. That's the word that everybody's using. You have these what are called highly respected human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, and all the rest, going on television and radio and then appearing as experts in all these different uh, media platforms, only talking about the suffering of the people in Gaza, the need for a ceasefire. They've run out of fuel already 53 days, right? And yet they're still functioning. They've run out of electricity, they've run out of water, they've run out of food, and yet they're all functioning. So that, that what I will call the, the propaganda machine is very, very active. And even for President Biden, 
and other and, and Secretary of State Blinken, who's on his way back to the region, it's very hard to ignore or resist, even though they are aware of the strategic imperatives. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. Amots, let's assume the fighting resumes. And in another month or two, Sinwar and some thousands of his remaining fighters will still be left in the South. The IDF will be dealing with pockets of resistance. Could you see an Arafat-type exit, like a Beirut-style scenario? that we had, I think it was in 1982, where Arafat and his terrorists uh, jumped on boats and sailed away? It might happen, but um, uh, I'm not sure this is what uh, this set of uh, terrorists uh, are built to do, unlike Arafat and, and what he commanded back then. These people are built differently and they have a different agenda and they have different convictions. And in my view, and I think that any sober uh, spectator must now conclude from what we've seen that what drives them is not nationalism, but religious fanaticism. And part of religious fanaticism, certainly in their version, is suicide. It's a value. And um, I, I wouldn't be, I would be surprised if suddenly they display this kind of, uh, of, of uh, desire to live and willingness to make ideological compromises for that sake. I don't think they're built this way. So I, it's not my prediction that we will face such a scenario. Should we somehow be surprised, then we'll have what to, um, what to consider. But I don't think this is where this is well, headed. These people. Amot, what do you think is a battle for life or death, uh, Steve? And and I think that death is what awaits them. What do you think is his end game, uh, Amot? What, what does he? How does he see this ending if the IDF is coming towards him? I think he's not as smart as we are all insinuating. There was a great deal of wisdom in the mechanics of the attack that he waged. And a lot of originality, a lot of um, uh, cunning, um, but in the broader scheme of things, um, he also made some very, very simple mistakes. For instance, totally misunderstanding the Israeli people and their psyche. He didn't understand that he was uniting the, the Israelis. He thought that he was disuniting them. That's one thing. He didn't understand the Jewish people. He didn't understand what, the, what he was doing was was um, sparking all of the reflexes in in the Jewish DNA um, that, that hark back to, to the worst atrocities of Jewish memory and that this will make the Jewish people uh, rally behind the Jewish state <clears throat> that will make him and his, or, and his organization an enemy in perpetuity of the Jewish people. All this he failed to calculate. And he failed to calculate the IDF's readiness for the kind of offensive that it has launched, uh, just like it was right. unprepared for the kind of defensive that he um, had in store for us. So I wouldn't make so much of his wisdom. And I think that he's now spent all of his cards, he's spent all of his wisdom, and he's in for defeat, and we should compromise for nothing less than his total defeat. All right, well, Gerald, some are suggesting that the focus on the hostage issue is somehow harming the war effort. And Sinwar may have get some things wrong about Israeli society. I think he's judged right about how important it is to everybody in Israel to return the hostages. Is our abundant concern for life, was it inevitable, uh, or could the war effort and the, and the effort to return the hostages ultimately go hand in hand, or maybe they are? Look, I don't want to sound trivial, but the answer is it's complicated. This is super complicated. Israeli society, Israeli psychology, Jew, it all gets mixed up into this. I want to make a quick comment 
uh, in addition to what Amot said a minute ago. It's not just that Sinwar miscalculated about Israel, but it's very similar to what happened with Arafat and Nasrallah. Arafat, around 2000, 2001, when he launched what is sometimes called mistakenly the Second Intifada, but I would prefer to call it Arafat's war, all the suicide bombings, all of that. It was also following the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon, same time period, early 2000, Ehud Barak was prime minister. It seemed like Israel was a spider web that was easily going to fall apart. Lots of internal division, lots of demonstrations. Opposite happened. And then we have Nasrallah in 2006 in Lebanon. So there are various examples of miscalculation and of, of the Israeli capability as a society to withstand and come back and to fight back and to put all of our differences aside. And that's something that is remarkable and important about Israeli society. So having said that then, the issues of what are the end games or what are the options, I think that Sinwar may be very prepared to commit suicide, to die in this situation and see himself <laughs> as a martyr in a long line, paving the way for the eventual weakening and destruction of Israel. They've talked about a perpetual war, unleashing a perpetual war. And they got that wrong, too, because Lebanon, Hezbollah, yes, there's been some skirmishing, some rockets fired, some deaths, but no big war. Yemen is a nuisance, but not really a significant factor. So All right, this I, is still... I just want to move on so we can cover just another a few aspects of this. Amos, let me turn back to you for a minute. Uh, Israelis have been glued to their TVs since October 7th, uh, all, all the more so when the ground operations began and with the spectacle uh, of the hostage deal uh, got underway. Has public or army reservist resolve changed much in your opinion, or is the army just as ready, and the public, just as ready as ever to continue the war as long as it takes to defeat Hamas? Nothing has changed. <clears throat> um, like so many of us, um, I'm surrounded uh, by people deep in this fighting. And um, uh, my impressions of the spirit are therefore direct and intensive and continuous. Nothing has been dented. Um, nothing has waned. And uh, everyone is also psychologically prepared for this struggle to continue uh, um, over at least a year. And uh, everyone is prepared to endure uh, what that uh, entails. And this is, I think, what we're in for. I, despite what I said about us needing to um, press for total victory, I'm not predicting that it's going to be swift. It's going to be protracted. It's going to be painstaking. We will have to go month after month, <clears throat> uh, ditch after ditch, um, one rocket launcher after another, one um, uh, uh, arms factory after another. It's going to be month in, month out for at least a year, but we will not rest until it's done. Gerald, I want to come back to President Biden for a minute. It seems like he's been there every step of the way. Maybe he's even out there ahead of our political leaders making announcement. U.S. forces... Uh, checking Iranian proxies in the region, uh, efforts to secure the hostage for ceasefire agreement, and support for the war to defeat Hamas. Is the U.S. still behind Israel on that final goal, the ultimate defeat of Hamas and whatever that takes? President Biden has restated that goal, sometimes in a little bit of a more hesitant way. But I think it was just yesterday or the day before when the American, the young girl, four-year-old, whose parents were killed, and she was released, and he expressed his, his sympathies, his embrace, and he also added at the end that Hamas must be defeated. I think that was an important message. Can he carry the United States, the Democratic Party, the rest of the Congress, the, the, particularly the, de the Democrats in Congress, with him? And I think that there are some, some questions that arise, again, because of the onslaught 
the um, propaganda onslaught about the, how we absolutely need to have a ceasefire and the suffering of all the people in, in Gaza and all the number of deaths, which nobody really knows, but they keep repeating the, the, either the estimates or the lies of the, uh, what's called the, the health ministry in Gaza. There's a tremendous amount of propaganda that's surrounding all of this in the United States. And we see it in, in the news broadcasts. We read it on the pages or, or at least the screens of, of the newspapers, the prominent ones, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post. That There's a crescendo. It's an orchestrated campaign. And that as soon as the war, if, the, if a war or assuming the war restarts, that's going to be increased. The first bombs that are dropped, the first buildings that are destroyed, the first tunnels that are destroyed and buildings on top of it fall in, we're going to hear the same. And we're going to have the United Nations... All those so, Gerald, we're just about out of time. The war, but we need a ceasefire. I'm just going to say, I just want to give Amo to, a chance to have a final word. Like uh, D Dr. Steinberg was saying, the EU, uh, even NATO, uh, not to mention what could uh, come from Washington, are going to be pressuring on the humanitarian issue. I already see it. I can see each and every one of these organizations pressuring, pushing Israel not to renew the warfare. As a person, I think like most of the country, that would like to see this thing end, it's very concerning to me that the pressure is going to be brought to bear on our political leaders to stop the war when we haven't yet won. Is that a danger in your mind? It's a danger, but um, um, my <clears throat> first of all, my recommendation for the Israeli government would be to ignore that kind of pressure. And for those who don't know, I come from the left. And um, I do want, uh, ultimately, a settlement with the Palestinians. And I am a veteran and a vocal fan of the two-state solution. So this is where I come from. And nevertheless, this is what I say about this part of the situation. Concerning um, uh, the European component of this pressure, I say this, European leaders should read thoroughly the message that the Dutch people just gave them. The Dutch people just voted sweepingly for a candidate that previously uh, was almost marginalized, right. um, uh, certainly not expected to, to win the kind of decisive victory he won. The reason he won it was because of this European disinclination to look jihadism in the eye and confront it. All right, Amots, we understand the point. The I got the point. Um, self are the European people themselves are telling their leaders, we will join them. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I think it was a great discussion. It's all the time we have today. Thank you to Professor Gerald Steinberg, head of NGO Monitor. And thanks to analyst Amots Asael. I'm Steve Liebowitz. This was ILTV's Insider. For more of the latest updates from Israel, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. Thanks for watching. Let's win this war and bring them home. Stay safe and shalom from Israel.